well, well, what have we here? Yes, against all reason and better judgment, the Help Me I Am In Hell show continues with a brand new episode of Degreelessness starting right fucking now. I'm your host, the indomitable and cuddly Shanghai Pete, champion of the people and your very good buddy in the mix. We've got a lot to get to today with what is essentially a Square Enix episode. <laughs> yeah, spoiler alert, sorry. Oh, hooray, Square Enix, so fun, right? Uh, fear not, though, there's much more lip lasciviousness leaking from the latrine of the gaming industry, so we'll have other stuff to get to as well. Better get scrubbed up, folks. We're going deep inside. Just time for a quick recap of the week, and let us start with a follow-up to last week's Sonic Origin story. Yeah, oh, shock of shocks, it's not good news! I'm sure this will not come as a surprise to many of you, it certainly didn't to me, but hey, uh, guess what? Have you heard? The original Sonic classics have been delisted in anticipation of the launch of Sonic Origins. Gee, who could have seen that coming? Only fucking everybody, or rather, anyone who has even a cursory interest in being honest about the state of the industry. So why are they doing this, do you suppose? Probably because the new $40 collection provides such an amazing value for consumers, right? No need for the old versions, why have them? This certainly is nothing more than just perfectly normal prudent housekeeping measures intended as just some innocuous tidying up of the franchise listing in digital store runs, right? Wrong. The reason is simple, it's the only reason there ever is. Money. That is why they do what they do, and it is the only reason they do what they do. Money. Now this thing in politics, but it applies equally well to the gaming industry. Follow the money. You want to know why a favorite game or franchise turned out the way it did? You want to know why they're selling it this way instead of this way? Want to know why the price point's over here instead of down here where everybody thought it would be? Follow the money. It literally is that simple. Sega, just like Square Enix wants more money, just like any other sufficiently large, disgusting corporate institution. Don't look for any other reasons, you won't find one. They just want more money, and they don't care how they have to get it. Ruin a beloved franchise that's been a gaming institution for decades? Ruin multiple franchises that have been beloved for decades? Sure, who gives a fuck? How much will that increase our profits? 0.5%? 2% maybe? Good enough, kill it. If you think there is any calculation beyond that that goes into decisions like this, you are either outstandingly naive or monstrously fucking stupid. The amount that these companies and publishers care, whether or not you like a franchise or game or series, IP, whatever, it extends only to how much they think they can get you to pay for it. If they feel like the amount that they can squeeze out of you is below a certain amount, that's the end of the conversation, bitch. Just like the abominable GTA trilogy from last year, they wiped out the original listings here because, of course, they want to force you to buy the new garbage instead. And why do they want to force you to do that? Well, because any sane individual wouldn't buy it otherwise. They know that what they're doing with its absurd price model is abhorrent and disgusting, and the only way people would buy it is if they were forced to. So they're gonna force you. Never forget that if they wanted to, they could just as easily adjust the pricing model and make the actual package itself more attractive to customers. Now, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, we used to call this getting what you paid for. But fortunately, we're past all that pro-consumer nonsense now, and besides, even if they did do that, it wouldn't make nearly as much money as simply forcing you to deal with the greedy, exploitative paywall bullshit, so they don't. Because they don't have to. Sadly, as we've seen proven time and time again over the years, people will put up with it. Because this is a Square Enix-themed episode, but also because I love torturing myself, and of course, by extension, you guys as well, let's make a super fun comparison between Sonic Origins and the Final Fantasy VII Remake. At first, you may be thinking these two games couldn't be more dissimilar. One is the side-scrolling 16-bit action platformer from the early 90s, spanning multiple fantastic games. The other is a single entry in a long-running JRPG series from the PlayStation era. And no, I don't count any of the other garbage they released with the FF7 name stamped on it. Though in fairness, I do hear good things about Crisis Core. Maybe I'll play that on an emulator sometime. Anyways, since everything in the industry comes down to money, almost every situation can be boiled down to just one of a few scenarios and both Sonic Origins and the Final Fantasy VII Remake can be classified under the one called Snatching Defeat from the Jaws of Victory, in which a company takes a concept for a game that sounds like there's just no way it could be anything but unbelievably fucking awesome, and yet somehow, against all odds and common sense, they manage the impossible and turn it into a complete clusterfuck disaster horror show. And not for any reason or circumstances that would realistically necessitate that from the perspective of any normal person. Stuff like lack of resources, unavoidable economic conditions, staffing problems, anything like that. But instead, simply because they want a little more profit. That's right, for the sake of somewhere around barely half a percent probably, corpos will literally destroy art. That's all it takes, that's the kind of people we're dealing with. <laughs> and yes, I know saying something like that is a tad melodramatic, 
and uh, I don't care because being dramatic is fun. Now, both Sonic Origins and Final Fantasy VII Remake to pretty much everybody sounded like ideas that couldn't fail. That would be literally impossible to fuck up. And I mean, to be fair, they are right in a way. They didn't fail to make money, but they did absolutely fail to make good games. But I mean, who cares about that, right? Unfortunately, we do. All they had to do was what they said they were gonna do though. That's all. You stated a goal, now just follow through. Remake Final Fantasy VII. Put a bunch of dope Sonic games into one single collection. Sounds easy, right? Wrong. They couldn't do that because just like with Final Fantasy VII Remake, Sonic Origins presented simply too good an opportunity for milking a big franchise name to squander it on any one single experience for one single price point. Not when you could easily get customers to spend two or three times that, just a few paywalls. Think about it. Why sell someone one Final Fantasy VII Remake when you could sell them 10? Why sell a Sonic collection with a bunch of new features and content when you could instead sell those features and content individually, separately, on top of the full price for the base game? Well, obviously because one would result in a good game for a fair price that provides good value and the other would, well, not. If you even remotely care about your customers or the quality of your products or the games that you make, you go with one option. If you couldn't give a fuck less about those things, well, you go with the other. And you all know, of course, which one we got in both cases. Womp womp, get wrecked, nerds. Moving on, I'm pleased to announce that we have a brand new installment of one of our longest running segments up next, I Told You So. This week's episode concerns this particular product's second feature in an I Told You So segment, the Steam Deck. The Steam what, you might be thinking? Yeah. <laughs> Exactly. And before anyone gets any sand in their vaginas, no, I'm not saying it flopped. I'm also not saying that it's not kind of cool or isn't doing well, I guess, comparatively. What I am saying, and what I was saying, is this. But at the end of the day, if you're playing a AAA PC game on something that's not a gaming PC, you're playing it in a way that it was not designed for. And that's always going to cause problems, be they major or minor. When you really get down to it, the Steam Deck is a product that jury rigs a method to run and play games on a platform and in a way that they were not designed for. And uh, that just sounds a little fucking bootleg to me. Will it work uh, to a certain extent? Yeah, absolutely. But is it going to be some insane Nintendo handheld killer that ushers in a whole new generation of PC handhelds? <laughs> get the fuck out of here. See, it's what I've always said. It's probably gonna be pretty cool, but it's gonna have some fucking problems. And, you know, to be clear, my opinion at the time, which I still hold today, as you can see, was not the thing was going to fail or be some catastrophic disaster. Obviously not. What I was saying though, what I was pushing back against was the utterly deranged idea of being puked around by new media elites and corpo MSN rags that the Steam Deck would somehow usher in this glorious new age of PC gaming in the living room and be forever known as the Nintendo Switch killer that it would be the second coming of PC gaming Jesus and change everything, a miracle product and other such nonsense. Y'all saw it, the word ultimate was used a lot. So uh, how's that going? Linus Tech Tips, the Steam Deck is incomplete. Very disappointing. The Steam Deck has issues. And what about Big Daddy Richie? Oh, avoid the Steam Deck, huh? And we also have The Verge saying the Steam Deck is a glorious mess. And here's someone else. I bought a Steam Deck and it's already broke. And uh, who are you, by the way, you bad as fuck. Anyway, as you can clearly see, looks like someone, me, was pretty damn close to the mark on calling this one, and some people, meaning just about everyone else, was, uh, fucking not. Hate to say it, but I love to say it. I told you so. Moving on, our main story tonight concerns the monstrous edifice of corporate greed and full-time machine used to grind down the bones of orphans, in addition to, of course, the spirit and hopes of video game fans everywhere, Square Enix. You know, the guys universally mocked for all their games constantly underperforming regardless how much money they made. Yeah, those guys. And man, <laughs> yo, not gonna lie, they have been getting it fucking poppin' recently. They've been working overtime to not only ruin their current popular franchises, but also retroactively destroy old ones in a time paradox. Not hearing many cries of abuse and crunch regarding that, though. And speaking of abuse, let us begin by addressing another story that's been doing the rounds this week regarding Sonic's co-creator, Yuji Naka. He's the original programmer for the OG Sonic games, and in general, just kind of an all-around G. Last time we heard from him was when he was working on a game for Square Enix called Balin Wonderland that I wasn't even aware of until the story broke, and which actually looked like it may have turned out pretty cool, but ultimately very much did not. Seems that Yuji Naka was actually aware that it wasn't really shaping up so hot and attempted to fix it. His reward for doing that, according to him, was to be fucking fired. 
So, in response, he's suing them, and very much rightly so, I may add. No details or specifics are out about the lawsuit yet, but to me at least, a beloved dev getting shit-canned by a company like Square Enix just for having the audacity to try and improve a game is just about the most Square Enix thing I can fucking think of. He was quoted as saying, Square Enix is a company that doesn't care about games or fans. <laughs> I mean, like, I'm sorry you had to find out firsthand, my G, but like, yeah, no fucking shit. As tragic as Yuji Naka's story is, though, it's not the biggest news this week. Sorry, buddy. For that, we're going to have to look at Square Enix's latest fire sale in which they abandoned some of the biggest studios and IPs that they have in a move that seems at best highly dubious. Now, as you know, I'm not interested in recounting all the facts of a story here. I'm not a journalist. <laughs> That's not what I do. There are plenty of journalists, both real and imagined, that have already taken care of that for us. Links in the description box down below if you're interested in a dry retelling of the facts coded in excess media knob slobber. But more importantly, that's not what's interesting. What I prefer to do is explain what all the nonsense actually means for people like myself and yourselves that aren't interested in choking down buckets of industry-approved narrative slop. That being said, we do need to at least run through the basic facts of the story to make sure we're all on the same page. So, here goes. On May 2nd, in this foul year of our lord, Square Enix announced that they had sold off IDOS, Crystal Dynamics, and Square Enix Montreal, as well as the rights to the franchises those studios develop for $300 million to some nightmarish corpo circus called Embracer. Among the most notable were Tomb Raider, Deus Ex, Thief, and Legacy of Kane. Now, there hasn't been a good Legacy of Kane game in what feels like an eternity, but nonetheless, it's still a fucking dope franchise and worthy of mention. I would definitely kick it with Raziel again if that were an option. But now, the super cozy and definitely harmless sounding Embracer group is in charge of what, if anything, happens to those franchises. Sounds horrifying, right? Yeah, probably. Not definitely, though, but probably. So let's take a look at just who or what the fuck Embracer group is. Based in Sweden, they're essentially the unicron of world-ending corpo dev slave markets. Once this deal goes through, they'll have more than 14,000 employees, 10,000 game developers, and over 120 internal studios. Sounds like a great environment, no doubt fantastic for cultivating creativity, am I right? So, who's already under the auspices of this ungodly leviathan? Anyone we know? As it happens, yes, Gearbox, THQ Nordic, Saber Interactive, and Deep Silver, among others. So Borderlands, the Space Marine franchise, and the Metro games, at the very least. Fucking oof. On one hand, the idea of one corporate monolith being in charge of that many franchises makes me go a big rubbery one. But on the other hand, we do need to be fair. And in fairness, Space Marine was great. Space Marine 2 does look awesome. Metro Exodus, I fucking love that shit. And the last Borderlands game I played, the... I think it was the first Tiny Tina's Wonderland release. That shit was fucking awesome too. So perhaps, maybe it's not doom and gloom after all. I mean, y'all know what kind of world we live in, so it probably is, but perhaps not. So why would they do this though? I mean, not why would they sell off those IPs and studios? We know they're a festering open sewer of corporate corruption and all they care about is money because fuck our games and customers, right? No, I'm not wondering why they did that. I'm wondering why they did it for such a little money. $300 million doesn't seem like a lot for fucking Deus Ex and Tomb Raider to say nothing of all the others. Well, surprisingly, they've actually offered an even more specific reason, which I can only assume is a horrifically misguided attempt at comedy, but you judge for yourself. Here's a snippet from their press release. The transaction will assist the company in adapting to the changes underway in the global business environment by establishing a more efficient allocation of resources, which will enhance corporate value by accelerating growth in the company's core businesses in the digital entertainment domain. In addition, the transaction enables the launch of new businesses by moving forward with investments in fields including blockchain, AI, and the cloud. Oh, ho, 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 ho. <laughs> yo, yo, this is simply amazing. Imagine being so out of touch with customers, the business, the industry, regular people, and basic humanity that you think mentioning how you threw Deus Ex and Tomb Raider into the ravening jaws of a voracious company like Embracer just so you could fund something universally hated like blockchain bullshit would work out in your favor. Now that, my friends, is exactly how little they know, 
and exactly how little they care about their customers and their games. I think that's fucking awesome. I love this, especially because it looks like the NFT market is completely collapsing literally as I speak. Right on time. That's good. A good way to tell just how completely fucked the industry and probably just people in general are is by how little companies like Square Enix attempt to hide the barbaric criminality and anti-consumer practices that they engage with on a daily basis as nothing more than a standard part of doing business. So, yeah. I'll just let you sit there with that pleasant thought for a moment. The show must go on though, so now that we've covered what they've done, why they did it, and who they did it with, let's talk about what might happen next. Let's do a best case scenario first. If you're a fan of Deus Ex, and I definitely am, you know that Square Enix had, prior to selling it off, for all intents and purposes, completely abandoned it. So, for this particular franchise, aside from them doing something apocalyptically psychotic, like turning it into a mobile game, we really can only go up from here. That's tentatively a good thing. That's good. I suppose, actually, we could probably toss Legacy of Kane series into that category. It's been effectively abandoned as well. So again, anything short of turning it into a godforsaken mobile game will likely be a good thing. That's good. As for Thief, can we even consider that an IP anymore? I like the old ones, but I never played the newer one for PS4. Does anyone know if it was good? Probably not a good sign that I haven't heard about it enough to even compel me to try it but who knows? That'll probably dictate just how much I mourn this particular franchise, and to be honest, yo, have you guys seen the trailers for Gloomwood? I don't know if anybody's gonna give a fuck about Thief, especially after that shit comes out. And lastly, for anyone who liked the recent Tomb Raider games, well, you guys are probably fucked. This isn't good. That was fun, but let's get fucking real, this is what they're most likely to do. First, they'll sack anyone not attached to, directly involved with, or already working on what they view as the primary cash pig franchises. So, if you're not crucial to something they think is guaranteed to make money, say goodbye, bitch! Next, they'll pull what I like to call a classic EA move, or getting BioWared in other words, and figure out which brands or studios will still move games if you slap their name on a box, and then gut the staff, keep only the name, and shut down everything else. Finally, they'll send anyone who was accidentally allowed to keep their job to the slave pits and furnaces which immolate value and turn whatever remains into low-effort, pay-to-win mobile games. With that pleasant thought, we arrive at our inevitable conclusion where we dispense with the pleasantries, yes, <laughs> that's what we've been doing prior to this moment being pleasant, and just say what's really going on. And just like when they pull the mask off the villain at the end of a Scooby-Doo episode, you're gonna find out that it was just standard corpo moves all along, folks. Yep. They're doing this pretty much all the time, constantly. The only difference is they don't always send a press release about it. You wonder what's going on in the industry? The real day-to-day -day operations? Well, you're fucking looking at it. These days, this type of corpo hunger game atrocities where miserable multitudes of employees get shuffled around in their tens of thousands as their betters in the corporate office play faceless number games with them, that accounts for about 80% of what the game industry actually does, just shuffle in numbers while making games, and eh, probably takes up the other 20%, maybe. The dehumanizing misery that they dispense on the heads of their miserable employees as they shuffle them around and ruin their fucking lives, upsetting their families just to squeeze out an extra percentage point of profit, that's what the industry really does. I mean, sure, sometimes they accidentally make a game that you kind of enjoy, but it's not their primary objective. It's not their main goal or something. And by sending a press release to highlight what they're doing here, they're essentially just saying the quiet part out loud broadcasting it even. In fact, if there wasn't a press release, would anyone outside of the people involved have even noticed the number and employee shuffling that this really represents that goes on behind the scenes constantly day in and day out anyway? I mean, I doubt it. Just more corpo games, folks. And the saddest part, the really real shit, most of the studios affected here were probably long ago gutted and divorced from any talent or value by modern assembly line corpo game design theory. Anyway, so go find a new game to play, dummy. Daddy's gonna have to ruin this one. All right, that's our show. Thank you so much for chilling, spending this little bit of your free time with us tonight. We love you today, and we love you all the fucking way, baby. I know our show isn't usually the happiest place on earth, but man, this episode got pretty fucking grim. On a letter note, though, the Patreon goes public next week, so more info on that soon, but you can see a preview of the merch we'll be offering here. Pretty fucking sick, right? Oh, and also, something else that's fun, I don't know if any of y'all have played 13 Sentinels, but I'm having a lot of fucking fun with it. Published by Atlas, developed by Vanillaware, yes, the Dragon's Crown and Odin Sphere guys. It's basically like a side-scrolling, sort of sci-fi mystery visual novel with Evangelion JRPG vibes broken up by this tactical RPG-style combat. 
I'm only about 10 hours into it right now, but I'm fucking loving it. So I recommend checking that out if that sounds fun to any of you and you're looking for something to play. All right, that's all for tonight, though. Please join us next week as we once again chase the games industry around the playground and try to push it into the mud. Chuck, chuck, woke up, smoke up, blood, then I pass out. Pass, pass out. Huh? Woke up, what up, smoke up, blood, then I'm back down.